Once upon a time, I was a part of the industry that exports beef off the land. Somewhere in the last 30 years, I've had to let go of my cattleman's ego. I now use cattle to heal the land. If we had to choose a team of heavyweight boxers, we'd know what to look for, or even marathon runners. But how do we choose a team of plumbers or electricians? On Kachana, our cattle, or our animals, are the plumbers and the electricians of the landscape. So I've got to we use cattle to grow more grass. We use cattle to stabilize creek beds, or creek banks, river banks. We use cattle to create low fuel zones. We use cattle to create fire breaks. We use our cattle for a lot of things. Nutrient transfer, planting seeds. Um, Nature does most of the culling, and I don't care what they look like, as long as they're contented. If they do the job, they get the job. Can you all hear me? All right. Thanks. I'd feel happier if all of you could smell, taste, touch, see and hear what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, photos don't cut it, but it's all we've got today. You'll notice that the slides are numbered. It's so I can find my way in the cheat sheet. But also, if there's a question to a particular slide that isn't answered during the presentation, please pull me up on that later. So let's have a look at what's happening in the catchments of five big river systems about a thousand kilometers northeast of here. The sunshine was heating up the ground and dehydrating it. The water was running off the top or evaporating off the soil surface. Minerals and nutrients were being washed away or blown away or leached out. In areas that could on occasion support fire, nutrients were being exhausted into the atmosphere. The feral stock that were there, biodiversity was de declining and the ferals weren't worth what they weren't worth what well getting the ferals away wouldn't have paid for the for what they were worth well, what it would have cost me um, sunshine water and land the basic ingredients for primary production what we didn't have enough of was biology money and local experience i'd only been acquainted with the land since 85 89, we got our lease. Then we had to create access. And um, Christmas 91, we moved out as a family. Uh, Jackie and I spent the first wet season sleeping in the back of the ute. The children slept on cots mounted on shearers' beds with a mozzie net over the top and a tarp when it rained. Our camp has got a little better over the years. But we haven't made a single dollar selling beef. Our cattle are more worth more to us as a land management tool than over the hook. We subsidize our efforts with off-farm income. The learning curve is ongoing. Spell checks generally don't recognize these four words. In the next few minutes, I hope to connect the dots. In our, 70, in our 750 millimeter rainfall desert, we have a simple four-step approach. First aid, step one. What we see there is 20 what it looks like when 20 millimeters of rain drop out of the sky in 20 minutes. Half an hour of sunshine and the soil surface was dry again. 
what we do is the first thing we do is we check out the patient and we do what makes sense at the time. Sometimes this requires surgery. But generally it's just as simple as changing bombshells, well raindrops from bombshells into mist irrigators. And the key for that is ground cover. Ground cover will shatter raindrops, slow down the water so it can seep into the soil and it'll slow down the evaporation once it stops raining and the sun shines. There's another reason why ground cover is critical. Soil temperature. When it got too hot for me to walk around, I knew it was 42 degrees in Jackie's kitchen and my feet were a lot tougher then than they are now. So how hot would the ground have been? The children learned very quickly not to stand still on bare ground. So what was happening to soil moisture and soil microorganisms? Earlier on I mentioned surgery. We are fortunate that we have one of the world's most talented landscape surgeons with us today. And we'll hear more from Peter this afternoon, so I won't talk much about surgery. Suffice to say, we do what we can with what we've got. This is my favorite surgical equipment, piece of equipment. I also have a back blade and a, and a ripper attachment. However, as we have to fly in our diesel, I try and use biological energy as much as possible. So in our situation, cow power is actually more cost effective in most of the situations. Step two, intensive care. In our situation, that generally means the targeted use of very high animal impact. We're generally talking about animal densities of 1,200 head per hectare, which means seven, uh, five to seven shifts per day. Lost myself. Oh yeah, and we say a, a cow has five mouths. One to feed herself and four to feed the soil. This is an area treated last year. This is the effect that we're after with our first treatment. We're, we're literally spreading nature's sunscreen. We want to maximize the ground cover and kickstart self-healing processes in the landscape. Some people resort to ultra high density. Ultra high density was pioneered by the Zietzman and O'Neill brothers in the mid 90s. Hendrik O'Neill was running herds of 300 to 500 head to achieve these densities. He had 10 to 15 meter wide lanes with a hot tape and a herder either side and the guy up front shifting the tape every 20 minutes. What we're trying to do is copy nature. This is what it looked like. Biological land renewal on a grand scale. This is a glimpse of one of the, of the last remaining model on the planet. Every year in the Mara, one and a half million wildebeest come to the area, visit it and massage the landscape for about three months. This picture was taken on a study tour in 2008. So back to Kachana. Rehab. Physio and massage and exercise. What we require is at least some vegetation and most pastoralists, or most pastoral operations can start at this level. What we're these animals have just spent the night working for me. What we're looking at is a herd density of about 1,500 head per hectare. If we had more than 1,500 head, we'd need more hectares. If, we'd only have, if, we, have, if we have a herd that's only two, about 250 head, an area 100 meters by 17 meters would give us the same density to work with. High densities give us high animal impact. And they also promote what I call herd action. I'll get to that later. Density is not about stocking rate, it's not about carrying capacity, and it's not about feeding our animals. Density is about harnessing and better using existing, existing animal energy. Our animals don't put on weight 
while they're walking to water or, or, or feeding. Our animals put on weight while they're sleeping or chewing their cud. So the time they spend walking and feeding is free animal energy that we can tap into. We've all seen a windsock blowing in the wind. There's air coming out of the smaller end. Plenty of it, enough to pump up a tire. But we can only pump up the tire if we run that air through a compressor. Once we have compressed air, we can do all sorts of things with it. Putting animals in high density is actually compressing animal energy. It, put, it enables us to put our animals to work. According to my book, densities of lower than 300 head per hectare are just like a windsock flapping in the wind. Those animals will be eating. You can feed animals, you can fatten animals, but the chances are they're not working for us as good as they could be. I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying is we're not necessarily optimizing on that, capitalizing on that animal energy. Animals working contentedly at these sorts of densities hardly lose cattle, calves to dingoes and dogs. Density and especially behavior are critical. What we're trying to do is awaken dormant herd instincts in our animals. And we also need to eliminate acquired unnatural behavior like camping on water or spreading too far. We're trying to... What we want is functional herd behavior that's appropriate for the context that we're working in. So there's no recipe here. What we're in fact doing is harnessing a biological storm. So I'll determine how many animals, where, when, how often, which direction, how soon, and, and a whole lot of things, and especially their behavior. What I'm wanting to capitalize on is herd action. So when I talk about physio and massage, this is what I'm after. We want our animals to be doing this sort of thing on their own. This makes life easier for beetles, ants, and other soil organisms. And if we're patient enough, also for dung beetles, uh, for earthworms. A moment ago, I mentioned exercise. By exercise, I mean a sound grazing plan. And I suspect Evan will be talking about that tomorrow. <laughs> I get most of my results during the growing season, when nature's awake. Mulching, evenly fertilizing and pruning vegetation. Sinking carbon into the soil, into the landscape. Tim mentioned it earlier on. Rebuilding productivity into our landscape comes before production. This photograph was taken in June this year. Now, if we had enough of this, we'd be in production mode and selling cattle. Well, we don't have enough of it, so we're what we harvest, we're putting feeding back into the landscape with our animals. In this particular instance, we were actually taking those nutrients and at night putting it back up, back up onto the hill where they got washed down. So I, there's a major nutrient transfer going on there. What we like about the process, we don't have to pay tax on sunshine. And it feels good to have nature on side, especially when she's showing us what to do. Sometimes she doesn't show, sometimes she'll slap you, but she'll tell you what to do if you listen. We don't need to get bigger or get out because we're scale neutral. Biology is doing the work. And as we get into production mode, our tools become more valuable the more they work for us. Why does this work? What's the secret? This is an economic map that I like to use. Nature runs on sunshine. The key is photosynthesis. 
plants, organize and distribute the paycheck. And I'm glad you brought up the sunshine today because that's the asset that we're probably not using enough of. Because if, at the end of the day, sunshine is the fuel that powers the motor of biodiversity. So we have three teams playing for each other. While everybody plays, or if everybody plays, while the sun shine and water drops out, shines and water drops out of the sky, everybody wins. It's a simple concept, but a complex process. And sometimes things go wrong. To survive as they did, earlier migrants to these shores had to learn how to use fire to get rid of vegetation that could no longer be recycled back into the soil through a biological manner. Biomass burning literally short circuits the economy. It also contributes to the dehydration of the landscape by exposing bare ground and ultimately to the drying of a continent. Along the way, we lose the life in our soils. Not only have we been doing this for a very long time, we can't afford to continue doing it at the current scale, which I guess is why we're all gathered here today. We can use animals to rebuild healthy landscapes. Herbivores behaving as nature intended them to behave make all the difference. The challenge is to manage and influence the behavior appropriately within a given context. <coughs> Annabelle, did you see Cleo on the right? <laughs> As stockmen, we put together and manage herds. Functional herds keep vegetation healthy. Christine Jones talks about liquid carbon pathways. Healthy vegetation feeds the little animals in the soil that build soil. Dr. Eli Ningham explains very well what should be happening in the world beneath our feet. Rainfall management is a result. It all begins with sound pastoral practices, hanging on to a little bit more water, a little longer each season. In a cattle enterprise, an increase in kilos of beef per hectare is probably a very simple way to measure our success. Biodiversity and water security are also very good indicators. We need, when water is a limiting factor, every millimeter counts. 25 hectares is an area 500 meters by 500 meters. This is an area that's large enough to be a commercial relevance and small enough to practice on without putting our business on the line. For every millimeter that drops out of the sky, we can fill a pool, on the, oh, this is on the 25 hectares, a pool two meters deep, 10 meters wide, and 12 and a half meters long. If you work in 44s, that's 1,250 44s for every millimetre of rain. For a so the reason why we do this calculation is because when we need to prepare our ground for when the bigger storms come or the bigger showers come. And we want to lose as little water as possible to gravity. It does not take long for a lot of water to gather. Just watch the news, then do the maths. There's really no mystery. If the soils can't capture and store water in a high, fall, high rainfall year, we'll lose it to gravity, and the papers call that flooding. And in a poor rainfall year, we'll lose it to soil surface evaporation, and many people like to call that a drought.
permanent creek flow is a result, not of rainfall, but of rainfall management. A result of increasing ground cover and decreasing soil surface, soil, uh, decreasing evaporation off bare ground. It's a result of groundwater and aquifers being replenished. Each year on Kachana, we want to see more sunshine entering the equation. Each year we want to see biodiversity increasing. We want to see more biomass, animals we've never seen before, existing animals in places they've never been before. We want to see the nutrients that are there cycling and not being washed downstream or exhausted into the atmosphere via fire. If water is going to flow off the property, we want that water to be as clean as possible. We still have plenty of bare ground on Kachana, and we still have heaps to learn. But if I can drink flowing water, fresh flowing water out of a creek, all year round, that out of a creek that used to be a dry eroding um, stream bed, I believe we're on the right track. This is looking upstream. The water is there because of the grass. It may seem counterintuitive. The water is there because of the grass. I used to fill three-day workshops with items on this list. I hope we'll cover a few over the next few days. But there are, in short, there are no recipes. Each station, each paddock is unique. There are guidelines, and a lot of them are area-specific, which is why it's so important that the land manager, that local knowledge is respected as well. And the good news is that we've in the recent years, there's a lot of very good science out there that's beginning to support or it's better, help us better learn and explain what's happening. Here's a small print. Hi, high animal impact is a power tool. If we get the herding right, but get the timing wrong, the chances are we'll kill our profits and our animals before we kill the land. If we get the herding wrong, we might, make, we might increase our cash flow, but over time we'll probably see less beef being produced off that same area. <laughs> Accidents will happen. As in any new thing, whether it's child learning to walk, Stockman learning to fly a chopper. If learning to deal with complexity only becomes easier and safer with practice. As pastoralists, we can offer solutions that are in line with how nature works. Solutions that are family friendly, Community friendly, high tech, uh, sorry, low tech, high skill. Such, sol such solutions would provide new knowledge, new skills, new jobs, new industries, new wealth. And this is what really gives me hope for us and our children up in this part of the world. I guess it's our job to get this message out to the broader community because it's more about than just feeding our families. It's about addressing historic degradation that got initiated sometimes thousands of years ago. So we, if we are to provide environmental services for the broader community, we need support of the whole community. We need the science out there to, back, to help us keep in line. But um, yeah, that's about all I've got to say. So thank you for bearing with me.